Hey everyone, in this tutorial we're going to see how to validate our Go data structures as well as regular variables. And we're going to be using a popular validator package by Go Playground. Now you might be wondering, well, why, why do we need this at all? Well, let me run a scenario by you. Let's say that you are creating a web service and you are accepting user input. Or maybe you're just creating a command line program and you're accepting user input. You don't want to trust whatever that user has provided you. And you also don't want to have to write a bunch of if statements or, or switch statements to have to cover all of your validation scenarios. So with this validation package, it actually makes it easy because we could define rules right in our data structure and we need to be able to validate those rules very easily. Um, so we're going to see that with a very basic example, but you can always expand it to much more complex things. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up my my terminal or my editor here. I'm using Visual Studio Code. Feel free to use whatever you want. I already do have a Go file within my Go path. We're going to populate it. Um, so we're going to say package main, and then we're going to say function main. Uh, so let's go ahead and define our data structure. And we're going to do our data structure first, and then we're going to work on variables. We're going to see a few different scenarios on on what might be useful to you. Um, so let's go ahead with the with the scenario that we want to create a user data structure. Um, so we're going to say type user. That's going to be a struct. And it's going to have a few properties in it. So it's going to have an ID. Um, let's say that's a string. Let's go ahead and say that we have a first name. Also a string. We have a last name string. A lot of strings here, uh, which is fine. But there's other, there's going to be different validators as well that apply beyond just strings. Um, but this makes the most sense for a user structure because this is more of a realistic scenario. So we're also going to have a username and we're going to have a password and maybe we have a type as well. All right, so we have our data structure. So now we can't just trust that these that the user is going to provide everything that we want. For example, maybe we want the password to be a certain length, maybe it has to be alphanumeric, maybe this ID has to be a UUID format. Who knows? Maybe maybe we don't want the user to be able to pass in something at all to these properties. So let's start accommodating different different scenarios. But first, let's go ahead and install that Go package. So inside this validator, um, as part of Go Playground on GitHub, let's go scroll down. We're gonna we're gonna copy in the installation command. So I'm gonna open it. I'm gonna go back into my terminal and I'm gonna paste it in. Um, it could take a variable amount of time to install, um, but you do want to just run that in your terminal. With that installed, now we can start defining our validation logic. Um, and like I said, we can do that directly inside of the data structure itself. So let's start with the ID. So common common form factor for IDs is that it's going to be a UUID. Uh, there's other there's other scenarios for IDs as well, but a common one is UUID. So what we can do is we can add an annotation here. So we can say uh, not JSON. We can say validate. And let's go ahead and say you know what we're going to allow it to be empty. Omit empty. And we're also going to say that it has to be a UID. For first name, uh, we're going to say that it's required. So validate, required. For last name, let's go ahead and say that is also required. For username, let's go ahead and say that uh, the username has to be an email and it is also required. So we're going to say required email. Password, uh, let's go ahead and say, you know what, a password is it's common that it's a certain length. So we're going to say validate. It's going to be required as well. And it's going to be, uh, let's go ahead and say that it has to be greater than or equal to 10 characters. And then finally, um, we're going to say validate. And this one, let's go ahead and say that the user is not allowed to type in a type. Um, so they cannot provide a type. So we're going to say is default. So by saying is default, we're basically saying it has to be the default of this particular data type being a string. If it is anything other than the strings default, um, then it's going to error out. Um, so this is our validation logic. And you might have much more complicated validation logic. Um, who knows? Um, but this, this could be a very simple scenario. And I can see that I forgot an ending quotation mark at the top there. So let's go ahead and see it in action. We're gonna we're gonna run through some test scenarios. So inside of our main function, let's go ahead and add our new user. So we're gonna say user, we're gonna say equals, we're gonna say user, let's define our properties here. Let's say the first name is going to be Nick. Uh, the last name is going to be Raboy. 
we're going to say that the username is going to be, uh, let's go ahead and say test at test.com. And then the password is going to be, let's go ahead and say one, two, three, four, five. And you know what, that, that's obviously going to fail because we have it to have it as greater than or equal to 10. But that's fine. We're going we're gonna to leave it at that for now. Um, and we're going to change our test as we progress. So we have our user. Uh, let's go ahead and try to validate it now. Uh, so we're going to say validate equals validator dot new. I'll save it. Um, in my editor, it did it did import that package on line three. Um, you may have to edit manually. Um, it's it's totally whatever whatever your editor uh, chooses here. But we have our validator created. Um, now let's go ahead and validate our struct. Um, so we're going to say we're going to look for an error. We're going to say validate. We're going to validate a struct, and we're going to pass in that particular struct. So user. Now, if there's an error, so if error is not equal to nil, that means that it failed for some reason. So we're going to print it out. So we're going to say fmt.println, and we're going to say error.error, .error. and we're going to save it. Um, and it also added fmt in my import section as well. So we have we have some basic basic code here. So let's go to run it and see what we get. So we're going to say go run main.go, and it failed because uh, on password, it, it doesn't satisfy the greater than or equal to tag. Um, so let's go ahead and change that. So we're going to say six, seven, eight, nine, and then zero. So that should be 10 characters. I'll save it. I'll run my command again. And it didn't print anything because nothing failed. Um, so for example, if I wanted to, I can change the username is no longer an email. I'm going to, I'm going to run it. And you know what? The username has failed because it didn't satisfy the email. All right, so let's go ahead and change that. I'm going to say maybe just gmail.com, and I'm going to add now a type. Um, so type, let's go ahead and say something, because remember, type can't exist. So I'm going to save it. I'm going to run it, and it failed because it's not the default of a string. Um, so you can see where this is pretty powerful stuff, and if you go to the actual documentation for this validator library, there are a lot of different validators that you can use and check upon. So this is what I have for my struct is basically the bare minimum. Um, so definitely read through the documentation, see what you can validate for, and know that it doesn't take a whole lot to do your validation logic. Now let's run through another scenario. Um, so oftentimes, you know what, the user has maybe registered with all of this information, but when they log in, the first name and last name for a login probably is not important because at that point in time they've already they already have the first name and last name in the database now they're just providing a username and password so that way they can validate so but remember first and last name is required so if we try to validate this user and those don't exist then we're going to get an error so now we can we can make some changes now um, so now let's go ahead and remove first name and last name we can validate that this will still fail it did fail. So first name and last name is required. But we can, what we can actually do is we can actually ignore certain properties in our struct. So on line 24, instead of saying validate.struct, we can say validate.struct uh, accept. And what we're going to do is we're going to provide the struct that we want to check for. And then we're going to provide a list of uh, properties or fields that we want to ignore validation logic on. So for example, first name and last name. So these two will, will not be applied. Um, so I'll run it again. I'll say go run main.go. It worked this time. But if I change the password, if the, if the password logic changes, or I mean the actual field value, and I run it again, it does still fail. Um, so that's an example where ignoring certain properties could be useful. Now, structs aren't the only thing that you probably want to validate for. You might want to validate regular variables as well. Um, so what we can do is we can we can start uh, doing a new validation. So let's go ahead and create another variable. Let's just go ahead and say password, and we're going to say equals, and we're going to say one two three four five. Now what we're going to do is we're going to recycle that validator on line twenty three, and we're going to try to validate it again. So we're going to say error equals, and we're going to say validate dot var instead of struct. We're going to pass in password. And we're going to pass in our rule. So in this case, our rule is saying, you know what? It must exist. So it, it is required. 
we're also going to say that it has to be greater than or equal to 10. So it's basically the same kind of uh, annotations that we could add to the struct itself, but we can do it independently on, on variables on demand as well. Um, so we're going to say if error not equal to nil, and we're going to just going to say fmt.println error.error. And we're going to save it. So let's go ahead and run it. And it failed. Um, so it failed on the greater than or equal to tag. Uh, let's go ahead and change that up. So we're going to say uh, 67890. And I'm going to clear my terminal. I'm going to run it again. And you can see it worked. Um, so this is this is pretty powerful stuff. And there's again, there's a lot more that you can do than what I've demonstrated here. But we basically saw three different scenarios. Um, and we didn't have to add a lot of code to make it possible. So important, we didn't have to add a lot of if statements or switch statements or anything along those lines. If you enjoyed this video, I definitely encourage you to subscribe to my channel and even like it as well, um, because there's a lot of other great go tutorials that I produce as well.